Your genes made you do it. You were born that way. I'm gonna use this as both the worst excuse to be an ally and as an apologetic for racism. Let's go. Alrighty guys, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're having a wonderful time so far. If not, maybe I'll be able to fix that. And if I do, please go ahead and feel free to subscribe and hit that like button. Also hit the bell notification icon if you want to know when new episodes come out. If you want to see episodes early as well as other goodies, please feel free to drop by over on my Patreon and see if you want to do that. Even just a dollar a month helps out a ton. And it gives you access to episodes several days in advance. Finally, obligatory merch store plug. Grab a Nekosaurus hoodie so you can have cat boobs on your chest. And speaking of a place that has plenty of cat boobs, usually. Let's move into the fan art section. We have an incredibly happy Cirrus by Meme Lord TV, a Neko Cirrus by MJ Sketchy, and a Very H Cirrus by Wombologist, which I'll totally use as a plug for a Very H mug. And with all that said, let's go ahead and get into talking about jeans. Not those kind of jeans. I'm a bit fat and I barely fit into them. But no, the jeans that make up practically every facet of your being. There's two bad apologetics I've heard when it comes to jeans, and one side is one that I fight for and the other one is one that I absolutely cannot stand. That would be LGBTQ rights and, of course, racists. I'm sure if you've been watching my channel long enough, you know exactly which side I'm on. Let's start with the warrior gene and then work backwards. When I did another similar Dangers of Wu episode, the 1351, one of the things I saw in my comment section a lot on that video, and also had people levy against me during live streams, was that my defense that socioeconomic factors and media bias had a lot to do with the 1350 violent crime statistic, was off base because apparently black people, according to these commenters, had something called the warrior gene and that made them predisposed to violent crime. At first, I just dismissed this notion entirely because it sounded stupid, and then I spent some time to do some research. This is because one of the apologetics I've heard from these same types of people is that black people are genetically predisposed for crime, and therefore are genetically inferior to white people in some way. But when the conversation moves to homosexuals or trans individuals, the argument suddenly changes. Now all of these things are a choice, and they are choices that apparently need to be condemned for some reason, because they affect some people somehow. So, is there actually any merit to the warrior gene? Well, yes and no. And this ties into LGBTQ people as well. Give me a second so I can take you on this interesting but somewhat convoluted journey. The gene in question when it comes to predispositions for violent crime is monoamine oxidase A. It popularly gained the title warrior gene because there are a few flaky links between variations of this gene and aggression. Now, let's go ahead and see some of the common cases in which which this gene has been used as an apologetic for violent behavior. A few years back, there was a murderer named Bradley Waldrop, whose defense attorneys actually ordered a test and established that he had the warrior gene. A biological defense was levied for his case, in order to argue some scientific rationale for diminishing his responsibility in the murders that he took part in. The variation of MAOA is linked to an underactive prefrontal cortex. This is an area of the brain that inhibits antisocial impulses. In Waldrop's case, defense expert William Burnett argued that a combination of his warrior gene variant and being abused as a child created a dangerous mix of circumstances that led him to be who he is today, thereby attempting to remove a lot of the responsibility for his actions. According to one of the jurors, Debbie Beatty, a diagnosis is a diagnosis, and it's there. A bad gene is a bad gene. The problem, though, is that pseudoscience and woo are still pseudoscience and woo no matter how convincing they are. So let's get into some of the issues with the MAOA gene. The first obvious one is that almost everyone has this gene. And the specific variation that was linked to increased aggressive behavior is present in 34% of the population in Europe. And it's present in everyone of every skin color. There doesn't seem to be an actual link between the two. And when it comes to trying to determine someone's violent behavior as a result of this gene, the actual violent crime statistics in Europe aren't representative of this number of people with the predisposition at all. The violent crime stats are much lower. Less than 3% of the population actually commit violent crime versus the 34% of the population that have this gene. So not only is it incredibly hard to actually call that gene a causal factor in violent crime, the numbers would suggest that there's barely even a correlative link, but one of those is usually pretty easy to establish. So what's actually to blame in these situations? Well, the variation of the MAOAG 
gene that's considered responsible for this type of violent behavior, as I said earlier, lowers the activity in the prefrontal part of the brain. The part that allows you to determine whether or not a particular antisocial behavior is, well, antisocial or harmful. When faced with social exclusion or ostracism, individuals with the low activity MAOA gene tend to show slightly higher levels of aggression than people with the high activity or norm MAOA gene. What we get from this though is that the proclivity for violent or aggressive behavior is about as causal as high blood pressure. One thing that could be determined was that chance to retaliate was identical between people with low and high activity MAOA genes. However, response to greater threats, where a high amount of loss could be perceived, was slightly higher in people with the low activity MAOA gene. This means the only time that this gene is actually going to cause any type of effect in the individual that we can perceive is when a threatening situation of such significance has happened, that retaliation would almost certainly be a form of self-defense. Meaning that even though Waldrop's defense attorneys were able to successfully get him off of death row, his defense attorneys effectively just sold the jury a bunch of snake oil. Studies have shown that any variation of this gene does not lead to somebody going on a murderous rampage. What we have found is that there are some, and a lot, of possible genetic links that increase aggression, like I said before, high blood pressure. What this means is that while there is a small genetic component to aggression, it seems that all that does is give a foundation that is then influenced heavily by environmental or societal factors. Like for instance, males being perceived as being more aggressive and expected to be more aggressive, taught that being aggressive is masculine, and then ultimately being two to three times more statistically significant in violent crimes as a result. Now I recognize that opens up the floor floodgates for a different type of apologetic once we start applying this exact same logic to homosexuals. This is where religious people will start to say, aha, that means that being gay is a choice, just like murder. Except no, that's not what it means. Allow me to show you guys some more research. Some massive studies have been done into the genetics of homosexuality, and many of them have concluded as of this year. So what did we find? Well, in a genetics conference in 2018, it was reported that there were five genetic variants associated with having a same-sex sexual partner. Also of note, the frequency of occurrence of gay individuals was increased in families that had siblings that were also gay, implying that there was at least some genetic aspect to being gay. And while we have found that there are several genetic variants that are associated with possibly being gay, what we found was that the variants of these genes called SNPs don't predict people's sexual behaviors. This means that there is no gay gene that determines whether or not someone has same-sex partners. The familial studies that showed a link between siblings and homosexuality also showed that there was about a 32% heritability of homosexual behavior, but that each individual SNP, or single nucleotide polymorphism, had a very small effect on whether or not someone would actually ever have a same-sex partner. Taking into account all SNPs measured in the study, this really only explained about 8 to 25 percent of the heritability of same-sex behavior. If we were to focus on the five statistically significant SNPs though, then it only explains one percent of behavior now. Meaning that much like with the warrior gene, the actual end result of these genes that lead to predispositions is less than three percent. Which means that they're statistically insignificant. We can't predict that somebody's going to be gay based on their genes, just like we can't predict that somebody's going to be aggressive based on their genes. So what tool do we actually get to use here? Well, instead of trying to use some genetic scale to determine whether or not somebody's gay, it seems to be that something like the Kinsey scale accurately predicts men's arousal when shown erotic pictures instead. Ultimately, this means that both with violent behavior and with homosexuality, there are environmental factors and there are biological factors at play that ultimately lead you to be who you are. It's the age-old nature versus nurture thing. But if we're focusing on the homosexual side of this genetics issue, that means that there's going to be at least one religious apologist who uses my video to say, aha, of course, it's not genetic. That means it's a choice. Except that's not what it means. You can't change who or what you're attracted to. This goes for fetishes, kinks, and even people. The environmental factors at play that shape one's attraction usually happen during the very formative years, and the biological components also have a lot to do with what hormones one was exposed to early in life. These are both factors that are largely outside of someone's control, as during the formative years you are typically under the guardianship of someone else, or at the very least, you don't exactly have your own autonomy yet. You don't have the ability to change your hormones at this stage, and you have zero ability to change your environment, which means that the goalposts 
Jesus would then be shifted for the religious apologist to say that, well, they can't control who they're attracted to, sure, but they can control whether or not they engage in homosexual acts, which are of course considered a sin to many Christians. And if they're a smart apologist and really want to lock me in a logical bind, they would reference to the first six minutes of this video where I mentioned that committing those crimes is still going to be a choice of the individual, regardless of the societal and biological factors involved. But again, if this is the apologetic that someone wants to bring up when dealing with this pseudoscience woo and all of the other nonsense, my response is going to be, there's a difference between homosexual sex and murder. Ultimately, outside of the sin argument, the only argument you can have against homosexuality is that you personally find it gross, as opposed to murder, where there's an actual effect that can be determined here. If you are one of these religious apologists and you want to see what the difference between sex and murder is, then I invite you to go to my affiliate, DDLG Playground, pick up a toy and some bondage gear, please use the coupon code SIRUS so you get 10% off, and kindly go screw yourself. Or if you've got a partner, screw them too. And when you wake up the next day and nothing significant has changed in your life, you'll know that there is a functional difference between sex and murder. Because had you murdered them or yourself, the, the next day would be significantly different. I don't know why that's the way I ended up explaining that. Anywho, point is, when it comes to things like murder, thievery, and other things that we consider crimes, these are things that actually impact other people's lives. If your brother is murdered, there's a huge impact on your life and everybody around them. If they're stolen from, there's another huge impact. If somebody randomly pegs them in the anus, that really isn't going to change much, as long as all parties involved consented. So what's our conclusion here? Well, the conclusion is that the warrior gene cannot be used as an apologetic to say that black people are somehow genetically inferior to white people, both because everyone has that gene, and the variation linked to aggression is in all races, insofar as humans even have races, and because we found that it's both biological and environmental environmental factors that ultimately lead to people's decisions, attempting to dismiss the socioeconomic status of any individual and dial everything back to genetics doesn't do you any good. The science isn't in your favor. When it comes to the similarly structured gay gene argument, no, being gay is not a choice. Unless you can find some way to change the environmental factors and the few biological factors involved, then you're not going to be able to make attraction to any one of any kind a choice. But I mentioned a bad apologetic when it came from LGBTQ people, people who I I fight for on my channel routinely, and that is the being gay is a choice argument. This is a common defense when someone says that I didn't have a choice in being gay, therefore what I want to do is okay. There's a reason this is a bad argument, and it's the reason I decided to talk about these two issues simultaneously. Whether or not being gay is a choice, unlike something like murder, there's no impact to it. There's no negative impact at all. And any secular argument against it will fall flat on its ass, much like when Mike Winger tried to make his secular argument against homosexuality. If we found out tomorrow that being gay was most certainly a choice, it wouldn't suddenly make being gay wrong. It wouldn't make homosexual sex wrong. Hell, it wouldn't even make 30-person dogpile orgies wrong. So stop treating being gay like it's something you should be ashamed of. Stop hiding behind the fact that it's not a choice. While all research suggests that it's most certainly not a choice, stop treating homosexuality like murder. That's the real dangers of Wu here, trying to dial everything back to genetics to use pseudoscience to fight on either side of this argument. This is junk pseudoscience that's used to excuse racism and to either create bad apologetics for or bad and bigoted arguments against homosexuality. If you want to do some further reading, I've provided links in the description below. Links to my affiliates and everything else is in the description as well. Why not stop by my merch shop if you get a chance? And if you enjoyed the video, Video but aren't already subscribed, please do so. Hit the notification bell to see new episodes when they come out, and please share the episode with your friends and like if you enjoyed it a lot. And with that, insert end of video tagline here.